Sorry, we got a little late in starting. Good morning and welcome um, to this uh, seminar, uh, which is a hybrid seminar on biodiversity, climate change, and nature-based solutions. And, um, uh, and we are talking about strengthening the capacities for these topic in, uh, topics in Asia. So this is a really a joint effort by the uh, Human and Social Development Sector Office. Um, the Climate Change, Resilience and Environment Cluster, and the Agriculture, Food, Nature-Based Development, Rural Development, Nature's, Nature and Rural Development Sector Office, AFNR. So it's really a joint effort by three, three sector groups for, um, for the seminar. Um, as you can uh, see from the title itself, it's an uh, interdisciplinary topic, uh, and this is very much in the spirit of intersectoral collaborations that have been uh, promoted through the new operating model of ADB since, since last year. Um, uh, ADB and Leiden University established uh, an MOU. Uh, Bruno, you were very much instrumental in that. Uh, um, and that MOU also mirrors the spirit of this interdisciplinary approach. So we're very, very delighted to welcome you all today. We're very delighted to welcome um, Professor Arnold T Tucker, a leading faculty member from Leiden University. He's here this week in the, uh, and uh, he kindly agreed to run the seminar today for us. So, but before I introduce uh, Professor Tucker, I'd like to invite um, Ayako Inagaki, uh, the Senior Sector Director for Human and Social Development to give opening remarks. Thank you very much, Shanti. And I promise you that this is the only, only officially sounding like, you know, a few minutes that you're going to spend with me. So um, on behalf of the Asian Development Bank, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Arnold Tucker, the professor of industrial ecology at the Institute of Environment Science, Leiden University, who has just arrived this morning from uh, China. Is, uh, if I understand correctly. Um, so uh, again, welcome to the ADB Leading University Joint Seminar, Biodiversity, Climate Change, and Nature-Based Solution. Uh, this hybrid event will discuss ways to strengthen capacities in developing Asia on this very important topic. Very important topic because uh, in this region, uh, we are really, um, um, privilege that the region is the most diverse biodiverse regions in the world with many di biodiversity hotspots and the greatest marine diversity. However, the world, including this region, is at really at a critical turning point. The changes in climate and lifestyle decline natural capital in uh, alarming speed we must find solutions with a sense of urgency and the coordinated actions. Asia and the Pacific is the front line in the battle against climate change. This battle is for the survival of our own ecosystems, the well being of the human being, and for the sake of our shared future and prosperity. If restored and well managed and valued properly, these natural capitals assets can help to mitigate global climate change and biodiversity loss in a cost-effective and impactful manner. So finding solutions in biodiversity and climate change require interdisciplinary collaboration. So as you know, ADB introduced a new operating model last year uh, so we're breaking our regional silos. So we're working across region. We're also working across theme and sectors. So also we're breaking silos in order to find a solution in a multi-sectoral uh, approach. And this is very much uh, symbolized here by the presence here of uh, Ramesh, who is our director general covering the whole sector group, as well as Bruno, who is leading our thematic groups and solutions. So ADB positions ourselves as a climate bank in this region, 
And we're also closely working with other development partners who are active in this area. So this is the scale up finance, develop knowledge of natural capital and generate financially sustainable project that deliver biodiversity and healthy ecosystem. Just a little bit on the higher education, because we believe that the higher education institutions play a really a critical role for research and development to find out novel solution for diverse biodiversity and climate change. Higher education is also a place to develop future leaders equipped with knowledge and skills for sustainable development using nature-based solutions. So ADB has an important role to play for developing network with world-class universities so that Asia and the Pacific can develop their capacities to come up with their own local solutions against global challenges. Uh, Dr. Arnold just shared with me that next week he's going to visit uh, some of the leading uh, university in Indonesia. And as you know, these universities are top class. At the same time, they really, really hunger for new solutions and new ideas coming from their uh, partners. So as part of this effort, ADB and the leading university signed an MOU in April 2023 for strategic partnership. The areas of collaboration include interdisciplinary solutions such as biodiversity, circular economy, urbanization, water and tax reform. The president of Leiden University will visit ADB in early June to meet President Massa. But before that, we really have the privilege of inviting Dr. Arnold for this seminar today. So Dr. Arnold has distinguished academic uh, career. In addition to being professor of Leiden University, he is the chair of the board of Leiden Delft Erasmus Center for Sustainability via Triple Helix Innovation Hub of Science, Business and Government. He has more than 190 peer reviewed papers and his research work are highly cited all over the world. His research work cover different aspects of sustainability, such as sustainable technology, sustainable product design, circular business models, and policies related to sustainable transition. Moreover, he worked for a long time at TNO, which is a nonprofit research organization interacting with policymakers, business leaders, and civil society organizations. So after his presentation and building on his rich knowledge and experience, we have um, a number of uh, ADB sector experts, a panelist. They are engaged in ADB operation in circular economy, agriculture, and education. They will discuss how we can strengthen capacity in our developing member country through ADB program project and technical assistance and the knowledge partnership that uh, again we have with the Leiden University. So the floor will be open after the panel discussion and I encourage all the act to all to actively participate, including our online participants in the discussion to come up with the interdisciplinary solution for diverse diversity, climate change, and nature-based solution. So I wish you a fruitful discussion during the seminar. And one important uh, information, because I close, uh, Dr. Arnold will stay in Manila for the week, and then he will deliver another talk at the Innovation Hub, is that correct? Innovation Hub, on 23 May from 10.30. So I will also encourage you to uh, listen to his talk at the innovation work. So and please free uh, to reach out to Dr. Arnold to learn more about his uh, wealth of knowledge and experience in this field. With this, uh, again, let's have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this uh, very nice introduction. Shanti also had an introduction, but since you introduced me already so well, we decided not to lose any time, and I'm starting now the presentation. Um, 
I must admit, I was a little bit, what is the focus of this? Because it's almost everything, eh? biodiversity, climate, anything. And they have another seminar on circularity on uh, Thursday. I meet your climate and your, uh, your uh, what is it? Uh, <clears throat> Nou ja, uh, your greenhouse gas and, 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 the, and energy specialist. So what I will show here is more showcase what we at Leiden Delft Erasmus uh, Universities and in Leiden do, mainly with regard, I would say, to, to biodiversity issues. First, uh, and I'm very grateful that you already indicated that, uh, and, and Annetje will stress this as well in two weeks uh, from now when she is visiting uh, this place, uh, actually, we see ourselves uh, as a partnership of three major universities in the west of the Netherlands. We are all, the three universities are based in the province of South Holland. We in Leiden are actually the oldest university uh, in the Netherlands, 1584, if I'm right, uh, uh, founded in our struggle to be free from the Spanish. Uh, sounds familiar, I guess, to Filipinos. Uh, uh, but then, uh, okay, we were the oldest, we are a general university, but then at some point, uh, very weird, I mean, two, until 200 years ago, if you wanted to do technical sciences, you had to go to the army. The only engineers were in the army to make things exactly wrong. Then some bright people said, we need to have a technical, uh, let's say, uh, a technical, uh, technical university for civil engineering. That was about 200 years ago founded in Delft, the famous Technical University of Delft, uh, you know, and that is the oldest and again, the most renowned in the we have in the Netherlands. Then if you look at Rotterdam Harbor, that is where the business was going on in the Netherlands. Yeah. And some hundred years ago, there were some businessmen who said, well, you know, all these universities all fine. We need a business university. So they founded the Erasmus University, what is now the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And that uh, is actually yeah, the university with, I would say, the best business school in the Netherlands for sure, and one of the best in Europe. If you then look at these universities, and if you look how we want to tackle, in this case, sustainability problems, but you can talk about many other problems, you always need a number of, I would say, research areas that work together. You need to understand the system from an economic and from an environmental and a social point of view. The institute that I was director of is really top class in the field of, I would say, environmental economic assessments, input output tables and so on. So that is what we cover in Leiden. If you then want to improve the world, go to Delft. Delft has all the technologies that you wish for, all the design specialists that you wish for, all the urban planners that you wish for. Yeah, so technology, in broad sense, you can get in Delft. And to make things work, it has to be good business in the system that we have at the moment. Okay, then go to Rotterdam. They have the best business school of, of the Netherlands. And of course, we also know that you don't get results if you don't apply good policies. Uh, and then all the universities, they basically have their governance, law schools, and so on. So this combination is really good for, I would say, organizing change in whatever field. The center that I lead is the Center for Sustainability. We have said, well, we want to focus on circular industries, cities and regions and agro food. And why is that? Because in our province, that are the big things. I will come back later, particularly on agro food. In the West of the Netherlands, we have the most advanced, I would say, intensive horticulture areas in the world. That is an innovation ecosystem that is probably second to none. And that is very interesting to work together with these parts of the world to see how you can actually implement that and then have intensive agriculture set free land for biodiversity and so on cities and regions are very important we have the challenge in uh, the netherlands that all these cities are not carbon neutral use a lot of energy so we have to transform them and again that is i would say very similar to what i see here in the regions that if you look at china where they built all the cities with a lot of steel a lot of cement and whatever super carbon intensive the way how to cool it is with air conditioning well okay we can do better than that yeah and then of course we have the whole industrial area where we really have to go to low carbon low material use uh, uh, systems 
Let me now go a little bit to give a number of examples what we do in the field of what I would say intensive, innovative agro-food systems, because as we all know, you really look at consumption-based accounting. If you look where the big pressures come from, that really, uh, I would say, affect biodiversity, it is agriculture. Very simple, very big thing. I think agriculture uses something like 70% of the water globally and 18, 90% of the land. Of course, there are other problems that affect uh, biodiversity, uh, climate change, invasive species, all these kind of things. But my gut feeling, or actually we calculate it all the time in our, <clears throat> in our work, if we don't get the agro-food system right, we can forget biodiversity. Then, of course, we do a lot of work, and that is actually in the institute I led. Half of the, the group, uh, 170 people, so let's say 80 people, they were working on biodiversity in the natural environment, doing biodiversity assessments, looking at remote sensing and that kind of things, looking at human-wildlife uh, conflicts and that kind of things. Uh, and then also an important thing that is really an emerging topic in our, uh, in our institute is that we look at nature-based solutions, climate adaptation and biodiversity in the urban environment, which is becoming more and more important as well, because we see that particularly here in, uh, in Asia, we get these big mega cities and how do you keep them livable? I had the pleasure to being Xiamen, very livable city. Okay, they are lucky, close to the ocean, all these kind of things. But you also see a little bit of planning where they really mm, made sure that there was a lot of greenery and all this kind of stuff. So it really felt nice. It, it felt okay to be there. And you cannot say that from all the cities in uh, Southeast Asia, not even in China. Let's go to agro-food systems. What do we do? The Netherlands is a global leader in intensive horticulture. What I show there is a typical horticulture area in the, I would say, in the west of my province, close to the sea. And you have a whole area where we grow tomatoes, where we grow peppers, uh, flowers, and so on. And it really has been developing over 80 years. And that is now, I would say, an innovation ecosystem. At this point, that sector actually makes more money with exporting the knowledge how to do it to other countries as the hardware, the fruits and the vegetables that we eat. Yeah, They even have set up what we call the World Horty uh, Center. That is actually a, a free place where knowledge institutes uh, at different levels, so universities like us, I would say practical educational uh, organizations and the sector work together in improving the knowledge and the knowledge ecosystem. So it's a big thing. It is one of our key sectors. I don't know exactly the details, but I think after the US, my country is the biggest exporter of agricultural products, which is very weird. We're super small. We are, I think... Uh, 300 kilometer in this direction and 250 in this direction. That is nothing compared to any country. And of course, since you're a small country, you export a lot, but still, yeah. <clears throat> of course, as you probably also know, we have a very famous agricultural university, Wageningen University, uh, which is more in the middle of the country. But particularly our colleagues of the technical university in Delft, they can bring in knowledge that becomes more and more important in the field of this intensive agriculture that Wageningen University may not have. Wageningen University is extremely good in, I would say, the green side of things. Yeah, seeds, improvement of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, plants and that kind of things. What Delft is extremely good at, they put in robotics. Uh, I show there a little, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, no, I forgot the name. Uh, this little helicopters, you know, a drone, of course, a drone, yeah, a drone. What you do now is basically you send your drones into the horticulture area and, and, and they see if plants are ill, ready for harvesting, and you send your robots to harvest and that kind of, that all goes automatically. You don't need a lot of pesticides anymore because you can dose it much more precise, that kind of thing. So it, it, it goes way beyond what I know. I'm not a technical specialist, but that is what they can do. Uh, of course, what my 
group is doing is we look at all the environmental impacts and the environmental consequences and the biodiversity consequences. And again, Rotterdam is looking at the business side of uh, things. And what we do then now already, we have a number of projects where uh, interestingly Leiden has actually uh, an, 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 an mm -hmm. institute that is actually working in Morocco. Mm -hmm. Morocco is very interested in actually uh, transforming or transposing the kind of knowledge that we have in the Westland, in the west of uh, the province mm -hmm. to Morocco. So we have a joint project basically with a few universities there. Hopefully, some of their people will do the PhD with us, of course, still grounded in Morocco. So we want to make sure that they go back and not stay with us and that they can build up their own sustainable horticulture kind of system there. Well, I'm pretty sure, I mean, we can do similar things in Asia uh, with you guys. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not too familiar with these kind of projects in Asia, but you are probably and we can think about how to set up these kind of exchanges. Then biodiversity and the natural environment. Uh, it was already indicated. I work with Universitas Pagajarang. I have a few PhDs from there. A few have been graduated. And at some point, I mean, it always takes some time, but after six years of interaction with Universitas Pagajarang, to my utter surprise, a year ago, they said, don't you want to be a visiting professor with us? So next week I go to Indonesia. I have with four other professors my inaugural speech. It is a very formal event. I have to dress up very nicely in black shoes and all those kind of things, but okay. I will show, give an example of the work of one of the current PhDs who's close to graduation. What he did, he used what we call an environmental input-output model. He looked at Indonesia, very detailed, province by province. And then we looked at things like, okay, if, let's say, the demand of oil palm and palm oil would doubling in the next 10 years, which is likely going to happen, yeah? What are the implications for the environment in Indonesia? And not only the environment, but also the social and the economic implications. It is very important that you don't do that at national level because palm oil is maybe 3% of the value added generated in Indonesia as a whole. But when you go to the Riau Islands, when you go to certain provinces in North Sumatra, when you go to certain provinces in Kalimantan, all of a sudden you see that 10% of the people depend for their jobs on these kind of things. So he can now quite easily calculate all kinds of scenarios. As you may know, the EU is not very happy with palm oil from Indonesia because, and, and there we go, you know, Western people, we always are very good to do like this. And then, uh, yeah, you destroy your pristine rainforest. We're going to ban the palm oil. Okay, Irland, that's his name. He calculated and then he found out that most of the exports of palm oil from Indonesia is actually to Bangladesh, India, China, and whatever. And the EU is maybe 5% of the target market. So at the end of the day, it is a big political fight about nothing. Yeah, We don't have any influence on how Indonesia is behaving by banning the imports. Indonesia, of course, politically, they have to say, boo, we don't like what the EU is doing. But in fact, we don't see a lot of economic implications. So it's the wrong policy in many ways. We have to help Indonesia to direct, maybe if you have expansion of palm oil plantations, yeah, to, let's say, uh, areas with low biodiversity value, yeah, that kind of things, and maybe certification and that kind of things. So that is one thing. We have another nice study done by a Chinese uh, PhD candidate that was paid actually by the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, Stewardship Council, uh, Scholarship Council, and he calculated if we people rich people who eat a lot of meat, if we would be, become moderate in meat, actually it was the so-called eat lancet diet. What we found out, of course, if you eat less meat, you need less, let's say, feed and fodder for the animals. You set them actually free an amount of land that is quite substantial. It, it is not marginal. It is really, I don't know how many hectares, but let's say that all of a sudden for the whole agricultural system, you need 20, 30% less land. Then, of course, we calculated where that could happen. And then we calculated how much carbon is sequestrated if we let rewild the land. And that was massive. If all of a sudden you have more trees, 
So you have above ground sequestration. But don't underestimate what happens underground with the roots, with the fungi and all this kind of stuff. We had specialists from the US. We had great models for that, helping us out. You know what he found out? If all the people in rich countries would be moderate with meat, not actually become all vegans or vegetarians, not just be moderate, we could save once off three times the carbon emissions of the whole world, three times in a year. Yeah. I mean, if you really are serious about carbon mitigation and maybe uh, buying more time for making the transition, this is a wonderful solution. Actually, Paul Behrens, who designed the whole study with Song Xiao, uh, he won uh, the Frontier Spirit Prize, a very prestigious prize, 500K for two PhDs. We do a lot of work, particularly in Africa, on human wildlife contracts. What you have there, you have farmers that have cattle, and then a lion comes in and eats the cattle, yeah, or something like that. Uh, okay, we were looking, how do you organize that? Uh, what, what is really happening? What is the damage for these farmers? How, how can you help them actually to actually, yeah, maybe it's almost impossible to live peaceful with lions, but, uh, you know, in a way that you don't shoot them and that kind of things. And of course, we have the more traditional things like ecosystem services and biodiversity monitoring. We work a lot with remote sensing and that kind of things. You can imagine if you want to assess biodiversity in the Amazon forest, you can send a lot of students into the fields and, you know, uh, see what kind of trees you have there. But if you have done it for a number of plots of lands and then you have a good satellite, you understand more or less what the control area consists of. Then with your satellite imaging the fish you can actually see roughly what kind of other trees are there and then if you know a little bit about how these species behave you can actually start to estimate what kind of species networks you have there and that kind of thing so that is also something that that is really important let's skip this one uh, nature-based solutions climate adaptation and biodiversity in the urban environment actually that is what they did in xiamen with the whole team uh, we have a nice program for or the Dutch Science Foundation and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Every year they define a, subic, a topic on which uh, a combined Sino-Dutch teams can apply for. We won the project two years ago. Uh, we have two PhDs in the Netherlands. We have a few PhDs in China. And what do we do? We actually look at... Um, integrated spatial modeling at city level of urban agriculture the use of roofs for all kinds of things like, let's say, gardens uh, or PV, uh, planning of green spaces uh, and building sites. And then we apply our biodiversity models or we do practical research that we really want to understand, like if you have an area that is organized like that, what are the species that we find there? What, what, what is the biodiversity network that we find there? Uh, we look, of course, at the reduction of uh, the heat island effect and the cooling effects. We look at surface water quality and surface water retention. Xiamen is a sponge city that, that tries to retain the water as good as possible that you will have when climate change is happening. You have more extreme weather events. Very important as well, uh, we have to look at the energy, the water, the materials and the carbon impacts of just building the city. I mean, one of the reasons that China is the biggest emitter of carbon at the moment is that you have this huge infrastructure development, yeah, with car, with basically with 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 with, with uh, cement and steel and whatever. If they could build a little bit in in other materials, their carbon emissions would go down. Uh, and from there. Uh, we want to develop guidelines for urban planning. So again, I think what I've told here, that is the core of, uh, I would say, the examples of I want to give. I think Leidendale for Rasmus has really good cards to help with uh, implementing, uh, let's say, intensive agriculture. Yeah, yeah, we can. So if you have people that really are in need for that and, and have ideas, we can, we can organize that. I think we're very good. I didn't even talk about the fact that we have the uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center is based in Leiden. In my institute, we have a number of 
the best people from that institute are visiting professors at the institute. So biodiversity assessments, how that links to value chains, that is something where we really are very good at. And then if you really want to work in cities and see how you can maintain biodiversity, how you can implement nature-based solutions and that kind of things, I think we're, we're quite strong in that as well. Now to the next one. We do that, by the way, in an inter- and transdisciplinary approach. We really want to work with practice. The project Xiamen is actually with the Xiamen city office and with a number of cities in the Netherlands. We have a lot of interaction with that. We don't want to be this ivory tower kind of specialists. Um, and then, well, a little bit of, and, and that is for me a bit a hard nut to crack. I, will be, I, I want to be brutally honest. I've been a director of an institute. I had to look at finances. How does it work in the Netherlands? How do we get the finances in? If I get a lot of master students and bachelor students in my program, that pays me money. You know, each uh, ECTS, each uh, student credit pays money. If we turn out PhD candidates and they graduate, that gives us money. Uh, of course, we also do projects. Uh, but I was with TNO, that is a not-for-profit research organization. There I did projects, let's say six months, three months, nine months, two years. I would say in a university that, is not, that doesn't work well. Uh, the senior people that we have, they are very needed in the education, very needed in the supervision of PhDs. And of course, in the margins, 10, 15% of the time, they can do projects. And we encourage that because that gives the link with practice, which is very important in the field of sustainability. But if most of our work all of a sudden becomes a kind of consultancy-like work, that becomes doesn't sit well with universities. So I've been thinking, and that is maybe the most important discussion that I want to have in the various meetings I have uh, this week. How can we make that work? Free universities or Leiden alone, and then sitting along with the kind of things that you do, actually giving out big loans and that kind of things. Well, to jump to a bit to the conclusions, what I think, what we could think of, if you really can have capacity development, and that's, I think, Shanti, why you're so instrumental in the collaboration between our universities and, uh, and the ADB, I think that is the key. If we could set up something, maybe as a startup, smaller projects in the field of like, how do we maybe develop educational programs with partner universities here? <clears throat> uh, and then... If you have a major investment program, I mean, the example that, that everybody is giving is Nusantara, the new capital of Indonesia. Actually, next week, there will be a workshop on biodiversity in, in, that, uh, in that capital. Well, why, if, if you really invest billions in that, why don't we team up with Leiden Delft Erasmus, a number of good Indonesian universities? And let's say you have a PhD program or something like that, of 10 PhDs that clearly have to stay in Indonesia and, of course, do their work in Indonesia and should not use the diploma to, to go abroad. But then you really develop the capacity in the country with knowledge that is top-notch from our part of the world. That, that is something that I think could work. Uh, well, I give a number of examples of academic master and PhD program. That's another thing, how we could work together that, that you send over master students or that our master students maybe do practical projects in this region. Well, we have all kinds of things. I would say it covers roughly the four big areas that I just indicated for Leiden Delft Erasmus. We have a number of specialties. We have what we call interdisciplinary thesis labs. So we put together let's say four or five students from totally different educational programs. And then we say, go and work on that common topic. Of course, the guy from the business school is still doing the business side. People from my institute will still do the biodiversity or the material flow side. Uh, the people from Delft, you know, they still will do the design side or the technical side. But they are interacting with each other and okay they have an additional supervisor that costs a bit of money but usually have an external party playing for that we can probably expand that maybe to students from this region i don't know if the quality is good and so on well we have transdisciplinary projects uh, like i said the one that we do in china we were lucky there was money that the Netherlands could spend with China. It's not always the case, but okay, there we have a trend, nice transdisciplinary project with people in the region. Uh, of course, we know a lot of universities here, but I will go through the list. Uh, it's just that we have networks, you guys have networks. 
And then I think indeed, like I said, what can we do? We can twin education in the ways that you already indicated, like maybe helping out with developing educational programs, uh, maybe supporting master thesis exchanges, which is already a little bit difficult because if, you know, if I got all of a sudden five master students from a university in Indonesia, no, my ministry of education is not paying for these students where they pay for my own students. Yeah, so we have to look at these kind of practical things as well. Um, even kijken hoor. Uh, there are funding programs in the EU where we can actually uh, support students from this region to actually uh, work in, in, and study in the Netherlands. And like I said, we can twin the kind of research in the ways that you already indicated. So what I see working quite well is we have a lot of countries here in the region that give their young people PhD stipends. It is then very important to make sure that they go back and not stay in the Netherlands or somewhere else. But I see actually in general, it works quite well. Even the Chinese who are relatively young when they get a stipend, I think 60, 70% at least goes back. The Indonesians all go back. Why? Because they only can get a stipend when they have a permanent position at the university. They usually are 35 or something like that. They have a family. They don't have an incentive to, to go abroad. So maybe one out of 10 is doing that. Uh, yeah. And then, like I said, if we really can think on the longer term to develop, let's say, really educational programs, PhD programs, alongside your big investment projects, I think that is, I think, the end goal that I really think could work quite well. I hope it didn't take too much time. This is the end of my story. And maybe, Shanti, you can now start moderating the discussion here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Where do you want to have it? I think, I think maybe Sorry. in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tucker, for uh, such a thought provoking presentation, um, encompassing so many different dimensions of your work, and especially the, the work of the LDE Alliance. We have a, like a very nice panel representing different groups. Uh, I request um, you to uh, join the podium. Uh, James Baker is the Senior Circular Economy Specialist uh, working on plastic wastes in the Environment Group in the Climate Change Resilience and Environment Cluster. James is responsible for leading ADB's Regional Marine Plastics Reduction Program and is supporting the operationalization of Strategy 2030, uh, Operational Priority 3, and the Healthy Ocean, Oceans Action Program. He's also responsible for supporting several uh, circular economy initiatives within ADB's uh, projects and investments. Um, uh, it, James has a very strong track record in industrial recycling. Now I'd like to invite Narayan Iyer, he's the Senior Natural Resources and Agriculture Specialist in the Agriculture, Food, Nature and Rural Development Sector Office. Thank you, Narayan. Um, he's the agribusiness agri specialist. His areas of interest include um, development of sustainable agribusinesses, protection and growth of natural capital, green financing, food security, ag tech, and private sector development. I think you had a long standing experience in banking and financing uh, of agribusiness. Uh, he's very actively involved in nature based solutions work in ADB. Then I'd like to uh, invite my colleague, Ryotaro Hayashi. He's a senior social sector, develop, uh, sector economist in the human and social development uh, sector office. Rio has been actively engaged in education operations in, of ADB in South Asia, working on improving education for the last six years. Uh, he works on higher education in Bangladesh and um, in Sri Lanka, as well as in Tibet and Bhutan. And he's recently initiated um, uh, networking program of higher education institutions on high-tech agriculture. So you have really a great panel. Um, but before I turn to, to them to request them to speak, I just wonder if DG Ramesh, you'd like to say a few words or... Okay. <laughs> Um, 
Okay, thank you very much, Shanti. Thank you, Professor Tucker, for your presentation. Uh, and it, it really speaks to where we are at ADB at the moment, our circular economy, our sustainability, and our systems understanding is, is getting more and more involved in our activities. Under the new operating model, I don't know if we can still call, keep calling it new, but under our operating model, we've restructured to allow us to address these much more complex projects. And this is where we're starting to see the interaction of environment, of social and of economic drivers, rather than just pure economic. And um, last weekend, uh, DG Bruno unfortunately had to step out, but we were looking at a um, bamboo project, which incorporates um, carbon sequestration through, um, through bamboo growth, um, climate change adaption by using uh, bamboo plants for soil stabilization, the reduce of silting into rivers and the sea, um, and the use of the bamboo as a construction material. So not only are you sequestering the or sucking the carbon from the atmosphere, but you're then locking it up for 50, 80 years in buildings. Um, and this type of project, which is being run by indigenous people um, across the Philippines, brings together those many different aspects of economies, of social, of economic development, and ADB's ability to understand those structure investments into these projects is key. And you mentioned Nusantara as well. Um, I was in Indonesia last week talking with the resident mission there. And again, this is an area where that kind of forestation, reforestation, degraded lands management through bamboo um, agriculture could help support the construction, um, the circularity of the city. Um, and it, it's rare for us to have these sort of new cities to work with. But if you look at the work that ADB is doing in, in the uh, People's Republic of China with circular systems, circular cities, um, and as we understand this more, then we begin to see the necessity for the metrics, innovative ways to measure our performance, report our performance. Uh, and just before we started, we were discussing the, the importance of ecosystem valuation. Uh, we've recently gone through a corporate results framework for the environment team uh, and trying to find a single metric that covers everything that we do in the environment team. And it is difficult. But if we can start bringing that back to a dollar value through ecosystems valuation, then it becomes much more easier to discuss that as part of a banking, as part of an economic development process. So I, I think this is a, a very important discussion that we're having today. I think it's very current for all of us. It looks closely at projects that we, we have underway at the moment in, within agriculture, within uh, regenerative agriculture. And I think Narayan will talk more about that. But it, it's going to support us if we can develop this partnership, develop these new metrics to support our projects moving forward. Um, and in certain cases, that enabling capacity of the metrics will be key for us to move forward with those projects. So I, I look forward to developing this and moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Shanti. First of all, I would like to thank Shanti and the team for inviting me here. Uh, I would also like to extend a hearty welcome to Professor Tucker. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk uh, as I was uh, sitting there and, and uh, you were going through your slides. Uh, it seems so pertinent, uh, you know, the topics that you covered to the work that we are doing here. And uh, that's really what kept me engaged uh, because often in, you know, when someone speaks for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, you kind of switch off in between, but that never happened. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy with many of the things that you mentioned. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, we as an organization, James did mention, highlighted the norm. We as an organization are undergoing uh, not only internal change, but also trying to react to the very fast changing world outside. Uh, and the issues that you uh, dealt with are some of the uh, issues that are topmost in our minds. Uh, so let me, you know, talk about a few of them and the relevance that uh, you know these issues have for us and how 
uh, I can connect them to the expertise that you bring uh, from, from the academic world. Uh, so first is, uh, you know, in the beginning of your talk, you, you alluded to in your own words or, or in your own way, what we call the climate uh, food nature nexus. Uh, so the climate change, food security, uh, and uh, nature loss, uh, they are very, very deeply intertwined, uh, the way we look at it. And I think you had the same message in, in different ways. Uh, and we believe that uh, in order to, uh, of course, you know, ADB has uh, an ambition to be uh, the leading climate bank of, of this region. And uh, that is stemming from obvious reasons. Uh, uh, but we also believe that because of this nexus, one of one of the uh, more effective ways of dealing with this is to invest in, in nature. Uh, not just invest in growth of nature, protection, conservation, but also invest in sectors that uh, support uh, you know, this whole uh, uh, ideology. Uh, and sitting in the agriculture food you know, and, and we've named our sector agriculture, food, nature, and rural development. Uh, and, and there is a strong reason for that. Uh, and you mentioned it too, that nature and agriculture, uh, they are very strongly linked. So you cannot, I think you mentioned that you cannot have a biodiversity increase if you don't deal with agriculture, you know, in the, in the correct manner. Uh, in fact, I was uh, visiting the Netherlands last month. I, I went to, uh, you know, Wageningen. Uh, and we had a very uh, excellent tour of uh, Wageningen's uh, farms uh, where they conduct a lot of experiments uh, and the work that they're doing in natural farming was really fascinating. And I've seen similar experiments in India, uh, which have actually, uh, which seem to be doing very well. Uh, and uh, investing in, you know, developing templates uh, of natural farming, which are which can be done in a viable, sustainable way, uh, and which can be scaled up for smallholder farmers, is truly something that we would look forward to, and we would look to have you know uh, academic knowledge uh, supporting these, uh, providing us you know with the scientific basis uh, for what you know we can do. Uh, so, coming back to the climate, food, nature nexus, as we call it. Uh, this is something that we are all aware of, but we feel that uh, we need to upskill ourselves uh, in order to better design projects that deal with uh, this nexus. Uh, and it has uh, a lot of our uh, projects have multiple dimensions to them. Like James mentioned, bamboo. Uh, uh, we are actually trying to, you know, do a bamboo project in India as well, uh, and the kind of uh, capacity uh, that the need for capacity enhancement that we see is not just amongst ourselves, but also, you know, uh, within the DMC at different levels, within the value chains, for instance, uh, different players, uh, the communities that grow the bamboo, you know, harvesting techniques to uh, how to, uh, you know, profit or how to benefit from the carbon sequestration uh, potential that bamboo has to how to process the, the bamboo better uh, so that there is less wastage, to how to, you know, uh, uh, how to extract information uh, through maybe digital technologies so that there is better efficiency in the whole, you know, value chain to market linkages, so on and so forth. So uh, it's just an example of the way we could design projects uh, in, a, in, a, in a better, better manner and how we could upskill ourselves uh, to to optimize this this whole uh, nexus between food security, uh, livelihoods, so climate adaptation, uh, the mitigation potential that such projects have, uh, and connect them to food security. Uh, so this is this is a very uh, a very critical thing we are looking at uh, how we can upscale not not just us but also our our clients uh, and the other stakeholders. Uh, uh, we also think that you know uh, in order to do this uh, we would need to uh, further develop the various tools uh, that uh, that we need to use uh, uh, to be more efficient and digital technology is something that's uh, already i would say all pervading uh, but whose potential can be further uh, utilized 
uh, to take it to unprecedented levels. I mean, digital technology is evolving at the, at the most rapid pace that you could uh, imagine. Uh, and the use cases of new technologies, uh, I would say, are only limited by imagination. So uh, there are so many things that you know you touched upon too, right from the you know the the very wide uh, uh, ranging impact of remote sensing uh, to going down uh, you know granular uh, collecting data from local data. We're doing uh, you know ecosystem service assessments uh, through our natural capital lab which utilizes information at, at all levels and uh, tries to apply, uh, you know, we're using invest models of Stanford University who are our knowledge partners for that. But we do uh, feel uh, not only the need, but also the desire to engage with multiple uh, uh, partners, multiple sources, multiple perspectives, uh, so that we can bring more richness to the way we uh, tackle, you know, these uh, problems and design projects. Uh, the third thing I would like to, and the last one, probably, uh, I mean, there are, there are just too many touch points that potentially we could talk about. But the thing that I also think is very important for us in the Asia and Pacific region is the blue economy. Uh, here, uh, you know, uh, we have some of the longest uh, coastlines, some of the, uh, uh, all our DMCs, most of them have some, uh, you know, connection with marine environment or other, and we have so many Pacific islands. Uh, so we believe that uh, uh, the emphasis that we've placed uh, on, you know, on the blue economy is not as much as uh, should be there. Uh, and uh, we have the opportunity to possibly take the lead in this. Uh, and uh, uh, we do need the uh, support in terms of knowledge and skills uh, to do this. Uh, I'll stop here. Happy to, you know, further uh, uh, elaborate on these things. Thanks. Great points. Thank you very much, Narayan. Um, uh, Ryotaro, I'm turning to you now. Um, you've been involved in recent development of a networking idea uh, around agriculture, high-tech agriculture. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Shanti, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taka, and the, it's a nice, uh, great uh, presentations. And the, we as an education sector group, uh, we are always thinking about how to promote interdisciplinary collaborations, uh, and particularly right now, ADB is in a uh, known uh, new operating model and trying to work with the agricultural sectors and the other sectors, and the, but it's always not so easy. But the, based upon your presentation, there is, uh, for example, interdisciplinary thesis lab, uh, which is very interesting and very practical, a way of, uh, you know, collaborating different disciplines into one project. And the, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about how we can mainstream this kind of uh, new ways of uh, doing things in our uh, project. But the, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, we also wanted to introduce some of uh, ADB initiatives, uh, how we can much more formalize uh, this kind of like a twinning program, which uh, you touched upon in, the pre in your presentations. So what we are doing right now, you know, our agriculture sector is a home to biodiversity, and it's also important uh, sectors for climate change mitigation and ad adaptation. And the, many of the developing countries actually has a comparative advantage uh, compared with the developed countries, because developed countries already moved from agriculture to industries and service sectors, but still developing countries has a, a lot of agriculture lands and the, the workforce uh, working on this uh, sector. But the, as Professor Taka mentioned, like uh, there are emerging technologies coming up, and the, our panelists also talked about like a new materials such as bamboos or new technologies like uh, AIs and the drone technologies and so on. So, uh, so it has been like agricultural extension services, uh, which is actually diffusing those kind of agricultural technologies. But the, since the nature of technologies are changing very fast and it's much more advanced, I think we believe uh, there is a significant role to play. Uh, for the higher education institutions uh, to nurture a new breed of uh, agricultural uh, entrepreneurs. So, so in this uh, background, uh, we are proposing this kind of uh, concept, uh, having a global hub in the center, so which is uh, probably typically coming from the you know, university in developed countries, such as like maybe Leiden universities or Wageningen universities. Or we are also discussing this concept with the Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, which is trying to lead uh, this global network. 
And the rather, I, I mean, I'm also handling like a higher education project and the having like a twinning program, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, personal connections at this moment. So if there is a professor getting PhD from New Zealand, they are trying to reach out, there's nothing wrong about it. But the, I think we wanted to, you know, I think uh, the role of ADB is trying to connect uh, the world-class university in the developing countries. So, so we wanted to, you know, invite some of the world-class university coming into uh, play as a global hub. And we as a ADB, you know, we, we work with the higher education institutions in Asia and Pacific. And what we are trying to do, uh, particularly for my project in Bangladesh, uh, we wanted to make the Bangladesh Agriculture University as a South Asia uh, regional hub. And the, so we, we, we cannot like uh, develop each and every you know, university's capacities uh, because there are so many universities in developing countries. But we identify uh, you know, one universities in the regions and we'll develop their capacities. And then we will connect this uh, Bangladesh Agriculture University to the global hub. And global hub will uh, transfer the technologies to the regional hub. And regional hub will not only you know, share this technology within the country, but also neighboring countries. So when it comes to Bangladesh Agriculture University, we want them to share the knowledge to you know, neighboring countries such as Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. And we are also trying to identify similar regional hub in Southeast Asia. It can be University of Philippines, Los Banos, or there's also another university interested in Uzbekistan to become a regional hub in Central Asia, so that we can you know, develop uh, this kind of network from Asian Pacific and trying to demonstrate as a success to be further replicated in other regions. And the, so this is something that like, we are working on it and we are open to you know, any university to, have, to be a global hub. And the, maybe like uh, based upon today's uh, discussions, uh, we will further explore opportunities with our Leidens and the other uh, world-class university to be part of it so that we can solve uh, the problem to enhance biodiversity and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rio. Um, this is the time to you know, open the floor for discussions. But before that, I just wondered, uh, Professor Tucker, do you want to like uh, say something in response to the panelists before we go into the floor discussion? Uh, I have some uh, also would like to ask you, but but maybe later because what you said about you know the university uh, role and uh, the sort of the master's programs, the Erasmus winners, sort of a lot of music to my ears. But but before that, before I I kind of jump in, I want to give the opportunity to, to the floor. But just quickly in response yeah. to the panelists, if you want to uh, yeah. say a few words, <clears throat> I, I think. Of course, I mean, it strikes a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of relations, what you say and what you say. And I think uh, we already had yesterday a bit of a discussion that, that triggered me, like university, university collaborations with different parts of the world, you really have to think that through. Uh, I have some experiences in Colombia, and what you basically saw there is that the professors there, the top level professors are frankly, and I hate to say it, they're not the best educated because yeah they cannot do anything about it they were educated in in in, in the difficult period in colombia and that kind of things so the young people go abroad and actually they're hardly accepted coming back because they are too smart yeah almost like that so you get actually what you don't want you get that these phd candidates that have it on a phd they basically find jobs elsewhere outside the country so i think what i learned from that is that you really have to think about okay almost you have to do a system analysis of the ecosystem of education where are they I have a totally different experience with Indonesia. You have the top universities there, IDB, uh, ITB, uh, UNPAD, uh, OGM, uh, UI. They all have people there at the top level that have been excellently educated abroad and they came back. Yeah. So you know that at the top level there, people know exactly what they're doing and so on and so on. I have PhDs, like I said, okay, they only can get a stipend to go to the Netherlands once they have a permanent position. They have families there. They know that when they go back to Indonesia, they will be valued. So they don't have the problem. They go back, 90% of them, yeah? So I think you, you also have to uh, take these contextual factors into account. I don't know Bangladesh, but you have to look at how are they financed, you know, that kind of things. And 
from that, you have to see how you can actually uh, get the ball rolling and how you have to use universities like us in the best way to do the capacity development in a way that you really develop capacity and not actually develop capacity of individuals who then go somewhere else. Maybe let's stop here. That's... Um, anyone from the floor, please jump in to um, share any observations or questions to Professor Tucker or, or in fact to any of the panelists if you want to share from the context of your own work. Anyone from the floor? Okay, one question regarding university's interest. You say sometimes you would like to cooperate, right? But you're also stretched in your resources. You can accept maybe three PhD students, but not 100. And what was wondering, what is driving university's interest to cooperate? Because I always think they do anything to be up in the university rankings, but maybe I'm wrong, yeah. A very good question. I think that depends by the country. <clears throat> in my country, it works like when I was a director and, and in Leiden University work like this, the Minister of Education gives the money to the rector. Yeah. On what basis? Basically accounting. How many master and bachelor students do you have? And how many PhDs have you graduated? And then the rector takes, Anneke takes her uh, part, you know, uh, because she has an office to run my dean, and then it came to me. So for me, it was pretty clear. If I can get a lot of PhDs, I don't care from where. Of course, they have to be good. Of course, they have to fit my program. You know, it, it has to fit the strategy. So in the Dutch situation, I'm quite happy with uh, LDPD candidates, with CC candidates, with people from a Colombian uh, stipend, whatever. That works quite well. Uh, and for that, if you have to collaborate and, and, and with universities here, build up relations, that's all in my interest. So you do it. And of course, at a personal level, I like it. I, you know, I, I really like to be in these countries and that kind of things. Yeah, uh, and, and, and then what they already indicated. I mean, uh, doing consultancy projects, we do it a bit because we want to, particularly in my field, we want to be connected with practice. Actually, to be, again, very, very open about it. 10, 15 years ago, CML, the institute that I led for 10 years, uh, was mainly doing consultancy. They were almost kicked out of the university because actually the rector at that point said, well, why do you need university money? You know, you don't educate a lot of master students. You don't educate a lot of PhDs. That is how I get my money. Why should I invest in you? Yeah. So then we made a turn to really become, a, let's say, a kind of normal institute. And we still do this 10, 50% consultancy with my senior staff. And that. So you have to look at these kind of incentives. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's very much like this. So that's why I am saying if I think in five years now, if you really have, let's say, somewhere a kind of joint PhD program with a bunch of universities, maybe your network, I don't know, you know, and you really see it works, then we're all very happy because then you know, maybe they graduate, half of them graduate with us, half of them graduate with the local universities. We get money for half of the graduates and, and that's okay. That works for us. In Germany, in, 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 in Belgium, maybe the system is totally different. I don't know. You know, so you have to look at these kind of things. And I think we can make it certainly work, but but we have to think very carefully about it. And uh, so I think at this moment, to have the startup, I think I, every university specialist in the Netherlands, as long as the salary is paid, I mean, you can squeeze out 10, 15 percent of your time to do, let's say, add on things as long as it's paid. You hire a postdoc or whatever to help you with the education for that money and then things work. I cannot delegate all my education to postdocs. That's not possible. They can delegate certain parts. <clears throat> and if you then have people like me and, and other people in the university that like to really collaborate, uh, having a foreign adventure, uh, and also they can think strategically about what is going to happen at the long term, I think then, then it works. Yeah. Perhaps I could just add a little bit extra onto that is, you know, where, where we are at the moment with circular economy, with moving forward, we, we're entering new realms. And as much as ADB can lead, we can invest, the measurement, the performance measurement, the metrics that we're using are not currently sufficient to fully capture what we're trying to achieve. So partnerships with the university, that genuine scientific research is becoming more and more necessary. For years, we've been able to run on 
traditional metrics, traditional approaches, but as we become more innovative and we look for how to capture, then we, we need that research and that, that credible research. So we've recently done some work on bioplastics under our technical assistance. And for that, we, we retained a consultant who is already a doctor, but the level of scientific rigor that he put into that research as what's provided the value for PSOD to move forward with it. So I think, you know, this, this level of scientific rig rigor, this level of innovation is becoming more and more critical for us as a bank so that we can demonstrate our impact, demonstrate our performance. And I think one of the key reasons that the, you know, the SDGs, we, we are not being progressing as well as they could is because we don't currently have the language, the metrics, to demonstrate how much value we add. I'd like to follow up on this one. I think a very good point. I'm sorry I did not uh, indicate it too much in this talk. Actually, tomorrow I talk, or Thursday, I believe, with one of your uh, chief statisticians. Uh, I probably will put it a little bit into the circular economy uh, talk. But exactly what you indicate now, uh, trying to understand uh, the socio-economic environmental impacts of the kind of investments that you do, I would say is really a specialty of, of what LDA can bring in. Uh, the Institute uh, CML in Leiden, we are basically, we have developed life cycle assessment and material flow analysis. We work a lot with these input-output assessment models. We don't have these kind of general equilibrium models, but uh, when we work with, for instance, with the, Net, uh, with the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, they have them and that kind of things. And uh, so I think indeed we are capable of developing the kind of new metrics to really integrate it to do integrated assessments, be it in terms of ecosystem services and monetize them and that kind of things. Or, yeah, the little example I gave from Elon that you really can do value chain analysis. What is the impact on the Indonesian economy of a measure like blocking import of palm oil, that, that kind of things. And very integratively with well-being and that kind of things. Uh, and, and, and that are things... Uh, I, I even can imagine that that even if you have a small project where you say, well, you know, I need a PhD candidate that's really good for six, seven months, and you pay them. As long as we can see a paper comes out of that, I'm happy. You know, why not? I mean, and the PhD will be very happy because, as the, yeah, the, you know, working with the ADB, get status, particularly for young people from the region. So that that is another thing to actually make that maybe the needs that you have to have more the short-term kind of outcomes to combine it with the work that you do. And then at the same time, having what you indicate, like, let's say, uh, the knowledge from the frontier. Yeah. Yeah. So just, you know, we, 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 we're stuck on this. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop after this. But a, a very current one is the discussions we are having with the bamboo. There, there exists a methodology for the carbon capture and sequestration of growing the bamboo. But there is not currently a voluntary methodology for the sequestration of that carbon into building materials and the life cycle analysis. So, you know, the actual greenhouse gas emissions contribution of the project can't be fully measured. Now, there is an opportunity for us to work with, with groups like Vera to establish that methodology, but the establishment and the defense of that methodology requires the scientific rigor, which is you know, beyond us as a bank, but well within the realms of university research, university study. So uh, a valuable opportunity. So if I may pick up on the, on the point about universities you just made, you know, ADB is, is also investing in a number of universities in the region. If we go back to the role of universities in this, and you mentioned a number of interdisciplinary um, approaches, uh, the, the thesis lab and the joint work of the LDE and the, and the whole, the, the bringing together of different disciplines. And what is that doing to the future of universities? Like if, if we, you know, like it, it's very clearly breaking so many silos. And, um, and what would you see are the two or three important uh, trends that you're observing? that um, you know, institutions in Asia can also learn from and catch up on that kind of interdisciplinary uh, uh, you, you know, bandwagon to make sure that um, the studies and the programs um, that we support are also geared to the future 
needs of societies and economies. For instance, if you were to say that, let's say if the 20 universities that ADB is supporting, every discipline must have at least one kind of sustainability skill or, or talent. Is that feasible? Should we aspire for that? Um, well, a very fundamental discussion. Actually, I was just appointed uh, as a special distinguished university professor by Anneke and team uh, for trans and disciplinary uh, research. And again, it comes a bit back like you have to understand how universities are funded and what basically gives the incentives to the individual people. So my take on these things is in the Dutch system, basically we are happy when your uh, master programs attract loads of students because you know, they get more money. I'm pretty convinced that what we do with thesis labs, with uh, making sure that people are educated in sustainability science, it's almost impossible to, to be not monodisciplinary, but at least to let them understand at the end of the study, sorry, there's more out there in the world than just your own discipline. That you have that sensitivity, that is crucial for me. Uh, and I think we make our uh, educational programs more popular. So that is good for us. Yeah, By having these kind of nice thesis labs, we tell them, you know, you can do uh, a master study, maybe, I don't know where with that practice. And you will be in touch with companies and practice and blah, blah. And you will see economic students all of a sudden. Okay, that, that is probably a plus in the favor of my educational program. And, and that is how it works. Then when it comes down to, inter and transdisciplinary uh, projects, then it becomes already more complicated. If you look at the funding structure in the Netherlands, we have the National Science Foundation, we basically have the EU. That are the two big funding streams that we have. Well, if I want to have, let's say, a massive interdisciplinary project from the Dutch Science Foundation, and I only come with people from Leiden University, no, forget about it. Okay, so that's why I'm happy with Leiden Delft Erasmus. I'm very happy that Leiden Delft Erasmus never became one university because I can say Leiden Delft Erasmus, I know them, I combine and I get money. Okay, fine. And then, of course, in the evaluations, you will see that multi and transdisciplinary research is seen as more valuable than that I come on only with my own discipline. I have a very nice example that I will explain actually in the circularity one. We have a big project, 5 million euros across Leiden Delft Erasmus with two other universities and 20 electronics firms. And that is about circular electronics. I mean, what you basically see, the, the very practical people from the companies, they tell the Rotterdam Business School, sorry, that PhD is now doing lunatic work. That is not totally, you know, is going nowhere. Oh, well, good that you say that. And then the PhD gets engaged with the companies and whatever, and you get this nice interaction that you want to have. And I think it is the future. The problem is a little bit that the incentive structures in the Netherlands are not in, totally aligned yet. Uh, and at the same time, I think we have to go into that direction because as uh, you say that, you all say that, all the problems that we face are multidisciplinary. The problems that we face appear to be more complex in practice than we behind the desk would think so. So you have to talk with people in practice. You have to use whatever knowledge, in the genius or whatever, how you, you have to use it. I mean, that is the future. And I really hope that the incentive structures that universities have to work it will are going to be wider. That's a little bit of bottleneck at the moment. Anyone else would like to jump in at this time? Please. Sorry, I'm kind of switching the topic for a second, but um, I just joined ADB a few months ago. I used to do um, ecosystem services valuation. So I was really interested in what James um, mentioned. And I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot um, your name. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nora. Um, about you're saying about um, working with the St uh, Stanford Lab and, and so forth. So my question is, how are those values being applied in ADB? And for Professor Tucker, um, I guess if you have any views on TNFD, the task force for nature related financial disclosures, if you think so, yeah, basically, or anyone on the panel, if you think initiatives like those are actually useful for, for safeguarding, you know, biodiversity, or they're just kind of kind of a greenwashing or kind of dumbing down valuation.
yeah uh so thanks uh, i don't think i'll get in, we can probably have offline discussion but uh, we are trying to apply these uh, ecosystem service assessments and valuation thereby uh to essentially demonstrate uh, to dmcs uh that the the ecosystem that you know we are examining uh, at that point in time is you know valuable to this extent and it also delivers certain benefits uh, so one if you want to protect those benefits uh, then you have to pay attention to that ecosystem and if require invest in its conservation or protection or if you want to uh, grow those benefits because for various reasons you know more of that is needed then this is the kind of investment that's needed or if if you want to uh, if those uh, benefits result in uh, or if certain other investments of uh, the dmc and adb are dependent partially or fully on those benefits uh, you know providing some kind of uh, inputs or or acting like a catalyzing or a catalyst uh, then you know uh, attention needs to be paid to that uh the other thing we are trying to do is uh, use that to compute you know measures like gross ecosystem product uh which uh, which again you know at, at a certain level are highlighting the contribution of of nature to to economic uh, growth and development uh, and then trying to underscore the importance of 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 nature of those ecosystems in so we, we are doing uh, you know assessments in five countries right now uh most of them are dealing with some specific uh, you know a project or issue that the dmc or the local government is facing and we're trying to provide inputs to to assist them to solve those thank you I'm afraid you have to explain for me because I'm not an ADB specialist. What is this Stars Forum Nature Financial Solutions or whatever? But it, it's kind of like, um, like, thank you, like TCFD for climate change. So it's more for the private sector where they look at um, basically how their operations affect climate change. So for TNFD, it's more nature biodiversity related. So it's looking at their impacts and dependencies yeah. on biodiversity. And it's basically trying to monetize these. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I was just wondering if, if you think those things are, are useful, but a well, lot of, yeah, please. I, I, I can see that for climate, it is very useful. I mean, uh, I mean, we had, uh, what is it? A uh, carbon pricing mm -hmm. scheme in the EU initially, not, not super efficient because there were free allowances giving away and that kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then actually, uh, I still work at TNO for one day a week. Uh, that is a supply research organization. And I worked there with a young guy, uh, Mohamed Ghaim. He's originally from Moroccan descent. And all of a sudden, oh, he became elected in the European Parliament four or five years ago. He is super smart. He worked with us in all kinds of uh, consumption-based carbon accounting projects. So he is a politician who knows his stuff. And he took upon basically the dossier of uh, the carbon border adjustment. And when you read that story, it's like uh, what we call in Dutch uh, a jongens book, uh, a book of a young guy, you know, really pushing things through. What he managed to do, we have now a law on a carbon border adjustment in the EU that puts a price on the imports of steel. You pay additional if you cannot show that the carbon emissions of your steel uh, were equal or lower as the average carbon emission for a kilogram of steel in the EU. I think the same applies for fertilizer and a few other things. In that w same law, they say, and now we're going to be serious with carbon pricing. So the allowances are going down, 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 up to the point that somewhere in 1930 and whatever, uh, carbon intensive firms really have to pay a lot. Well, that is going to change the ball game totally, really totally. Uh, there were even things that at some point uh, people from the house of, uh, what is it, uh, afgevaardigde, uh, one, of, one of the houses uh, of, of, of uh, the US, they came to him, like, what the hell are you doing? You know, now we have to pay and blah, blah. Uh, wait a minute. 
why don't we do it jointly? You know, who is the worst carbon emitter in the world at the moment when it comes down to these kind of things? And then they quickly thought, oh, that's China. You can imagine what's happening. It's, it's politics going on there. We don't have a joint carbon border adjustment yet with the US. But this is a game changer. Yeah. So and this is for carbon that is relatively still complex, but relatively easy. I can imagine that if you want to do similar things for uh, biodiversity impacts or whatever, but well, maybe 10 years down the line, we say yes. Uh, you know, maybe the much better way of dealing with biodiversity loss due to palm oil in Indonesia is not banning it, but pricing it. Yeah. And then the Indonesians will find out, oh, but then we have to do the palm oil plantations there because the biodiversity loss is minimal. Or we have, I don't know, maybe you can do regenerative agriculture of palm oil and you can show that the biodiversity loss is actually minimal, that kind of things. So I think that is a way in the future to do these kind of things. But it's also clear that for biodiversity, you have a long way to go. I think we talk about carbon pricing for 10, 20 years, and now we have to get them a kind of working. Yeah. Yeah. And just to sort of pick up on that, it's um, the problem is the methodology. You know, I mean, for carbon, we, you know, the UNFCC, the Clean Development Mechanism, set out a, a wide range of methodologies for those calculations. And, you know, as we look at biodiversity ecosystems valuations, there's lots of methodologies for doing it, but there's no universal one. And that, I think, that, 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 that acceptable, you know, the, the acceptable norm is just not there yet, but it's something we've got to work towards. And it's becoming, you know, as Narayan says, it's a question of communication. People understand dollars. Economic models are run in dollars. You know, people tried with triple bottom lines and all sorts of approaches to try and monetize value, value give a value to the ecosystem, giving a value to the environment and basically change it from an externality to internal to the balance sheet. And, and we're not there, but it is somewhere we, we're going to have to go. Um, so, you know, it's, it's and again, it comes back to the scientific rigor, the approach. What does ADB adopt? What can we defend? Uh, just one last, last thing on TNFD. Uh, <laughs> I mean, TNFD obviously is relatively new compared with you know, TCFD, and uh, it has potential. Uh, but it's a long-drawn process, and the draft framework has just been, you know, uh, just come out a few months ago. It's a long-drawn process because uh, I would equate, you know, these kind of uh, uh, disclosure requirements with that of, uh, let's say, disclosure of financial performance, uh, which is now well accepted. Uh, the track record of having the need for audited financial statements of companies has a long history now and is well accepted. It's information, but it's, you know, validated information. We seek to do the same with, you know, nature dis related financial uh, disclosures. Uh, it has to be, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 it has to be mandated. We are not yet there. Once you mandate these kind of disclosures, then they begin to have an impact on how uh, the companies, the private sector uh, behave. And that's really the utility of this, because that gives them additional information to investors and to everyone else uh, uh, to deal with them. Uh, I mean, we are in the right direction, but we are still, uh, I think, years away before you know it's effective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Tucker, for uh, this very interesting and in engaging presentation and dialogue. Thank you to our panelists, James Narayan and Ryutaro. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite uh, uh, Yoko Watanabe, Director Environment in the Climate Change Resilience and Environments Cluster for closing remarks. Yoko. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tucker, for the comprehensive and inspiring presentation. And also, congratulations to the panelists for a really diverse sort of perspective bringing in. And first of all, I really want to thank, you know, Shanti and uh, Ayako for bringing this together, because I have to say from the uh, environment team and the CCRE, I think uh, since I'm uh, also very new, it's the first time that we are corroborating um, as far as the past eight months that I've been here to work together on this very important topic of biodiversity and nature-based solutions and the need for human capacity and uh, capacity building and, and the need in the Asia and the Pacific. And just to um, 
you know, emphasize here, the cl- being a climate bank uh, for the ADB, the, re- the solution is not just coming from energy transition or transportation, sustainable cities and others, but the nature solutions is really core to our business because basically as uh, Professor Tucker and others mentioned, 30% of the carbon, human uh, made carbon is made from deforestation and agriculture production and other means. So the solution also have to come from nature-based. And un- unless we really address the issue of how we can do regenerative agriculture and sustainable agriculture, or how we can do forestry and forest management, or how do we do wetland management, which really has a lot of carbon benefit. We are not going to meet the end results of having the climate crisis, and also biodiversity loss. So from that perspective, we're really emphasizing that we really need to meet, make that shift in, in ADB as well as Asia and the Pacific to really think about how do we protect and restore and maintain natural resources and nature and biodiversity in that regard. And also I have to emphasize that sustainable development in Asia Pacific hugely relies on natural resources. We know that uh, 63% of our GDP relies on natural resources. That's $19.5 trillion a year is relied on natural resources. So if we don't really address this issue, there's no future for the Asia and the Pacific. So from all that, we are really looking into how can we do more on this area? And actually the TNFD issue, the trans- this is a task force on nature and dis- financial disclosure. We are in the midst of discussion with our controller and our finance colleagues on how we can do that. Building on already 200 plus companies have voluntarily worked on this and the MDBs are all coming together to see how we can actually institutionalize in our own organization and also work with uh, uh, the uh, developing countries, member countries to work on this and strengthen that. So from all angle, we are really looking into, you know, furthering, enhancing biodiversity loss, strengthening nature-based solutions. Circular economy is one of the key area that we're working on at ADB to have a more circular economy that is also regenerating nature. It's not only about waste issue, but it's a circular. So we really need to think about those further. And we also have nature-based solutions finance hub. We have been working on air pollution. So there are a lot of things that we can work together by bringing in all the teams together at ADB. And Professor Tucker, your presentation basically is bringing in the different teams here in ADB to come together. And you have a key role to play to have that cadre of young people to come into this space and have a more interdisciplinary thinking on this area because you know when I was studying environmental issues, biodiversity people were always biodiversity people. Climate change people were climate change people and we didn't talk to each other. And education people or behavior change was another whole different field. So I think, you know, bringing in all these together and work on this very issue as a climate bank is a really, really important and timely initiative. So with that few words, thank you very much again for your really good presentation. And uh, thank you very much for everyone to be joining this uh, very uh, enlightening uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you.